This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Volturo, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely, starting at just one milligram. Go to Volturo.com to deposit some Bitcoin and start trading today. And by Shapeshift. With no account or sign-up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell gems, Dash, Nubits, Monero, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to Shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastien Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. And we're here today with William Mugayar. He is based in Toronto and he's a very experienced technology um, executive. He's worked at HP, so Hewlett Packard for a long time. He's uh, started or was CEO of a few tech startups. And uh, recently he's been an investor in some Bitcoin companies like ChangeTip. And what we're going to talk about quite a bit today, uh, Open Bazaar or OB1, the company behind Open Bazaar. And he's also an advisor to Ethereum, so he's, he's, he's quite involved in this space, especially sort of some, from the perspective of a you know, experienced guy and also an investor. So I'm super excited to have him on. Uh, thanks for joining us today, William. Thank you. It's great to be here. So a question we often ask our guests, uh, how did you get involved in Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency space? Yeah, well, uh, I was lucky that uh, since I'm living in Toronto, uh, I became involved um, actively when I heard of Vitalik uh, having started Ethereum. But even prior to that, um, I had been uh, hanging around uh, Fred Wilson's blog uh, for a while, and uh, he started to talk about Bitcoin back uh, in 2013. And um, I was very intrigued. Um, about the topic and started to get involved with it uh, towards the end of 2000, middle to end of 2013. Uh, so almost close to two years so far. But I really became very excited because I saw a lot of similarities with what had happened with the internet uh, back in 94, 95. And I had been there. I have been part of the internet evolution and uh, how it unraveled in front of us uh, from day one. Uh, I was involved at the time with an organization called CommerceNet, which was the equivalent of the Bitcoin Foundation today. So we were working on standards and uh, advocacy and security and payments uh, in Canada and in the US. Uh, CommerceNet was based out of Silicon Valley in Palo Alto. So I've seen this movie before, more or less, and uh, I am very, very excited about um, what Bitcoin uh, will, will do for, for the next 10 years in, in terms of the impact it's going to have on the internet. Yeah, I mean, we often forget. I mean, Brian and I were both in our early 30s and we, we were there when hey, the internet hey. first started, but weren't really old enough to really hey, remember uh, what was I, happening I, I, in, I'm in, not, in reality. I'm not 30. I have, to, I have to object here. I'm not 30 yet. <laughs> okay, so we're both, <laughs> both turning so soon. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's always interesting to, to have uh, sort of the perspective of someone who was there when they were about our age and, uh, and how things were happening then. And so I'm, I'm curious about this CommerceNet organization. What, what were they doing specifically? Well, it, it was pretty much the equivalent of the Bitcoin Foundation when it started. Basically, the intent was to work on uh, standards, on uh, education. So it's a, it's a bit maybe a, a bit the Coin Center and the Bitcoin Foundation. So uh, it was a lot of education. Uh, payments, internet payments were very, very big at the time. Uh, because just for memory's sake, uh, now we take internet payments for granted, but I can tell you for the first three years of the internet, uh, the banks did not want to touch internet payments. Uh, if you wanted to do internet payments up until 97 or so, you had to jump through a lot of hoops. Uh, it was done with what was called internet gateways. So you had to go through these outside uh, servers that had uh, the setups for doing internet payments. And now we take it for granted, obviously we can do, we can pay for anything on the internet, but that wasn't the case before. So that's what CommerceNet was working on and also working on use cases, working with uh, small companies and large companies uh, and, and trying to uh, explain what 
how companies were adopting uh, the internet uh, from an e-commerce perspective. So the genesis of, uh, of CommerceNet, na namely the name, is, is, was to promote commerce on the internet uh, from the early days because it was perceived to be uh, one of the key applications uh, of the internet. And, and do you see any similarities with some of the backlash that Bitcoin has gotten specifically in the press these last, I mean, not so much now, but in the last few years with some of the same criticism that the internet was getting in the beginning? Definitely. I mean, the uh, like internet payments, the banks did not want to touch internet payments. It was this kind of thing that was not secure. Um, they were saying uh, um, they, were, they were not guaranteeing anything and, and uh, there was a lot of backlash. Uh, even when there were talks about having internet tax, uh, like adding, internet, uh, adding a special tax on top of the internet in, in some countries, uh, some governments, in the same way that some governments are thinking about uh, adding a tax on Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, I mean, these are some of the things that then went away. Uh, it, they became non-issues. Uh, so definitely there are similarities, uh, but we have to keep pushing ahead. I mean, this thing is not going to get built in, in two years or three years. Uh, as much as there is excitement uh, in the space, and there was excitement in the internet space in 94, 95, 96, 97, it, it took a long time. It took about three years, at least, for everybody to start to understand the internet back in in those days. And and the internet was not as complex as Bitcoin is uh, today. So I predict, uh, for sure, we have another two years of education, of educating people about what Bitcoin is, uh, what it can do, what the blockchains are. I mean, what, what's common it, is that they have a multiple personality, meaning that they are different things to different people. And if you ask anybody about uh, what they are doing with the Internet today, they'll each give you a different answer, depending if they use it for web content or whether they are selling something on the Internet or whether they are using it for communication and, and many different uses. Same thing with Bitcoin. Uh, you are, right now, those that are involved in the Bitcoin space are very few, uh, but each one will have a different use case for them. So what's common is that the narrative is very rich. The story is very interesting. Uh, and each one of us will find its own story about how we use Bitcoin and the blockchain. In the same way that we are we have found our own story in how we use the internet. And that's what's really exciting. But this thing is going to take time. I really, really would like people to realize that this thing is not, a get, is not going to get built in, in one or two years. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll talk about this later on in terms of uh, whether there is a, a bubble or a crash. And what, what really brought the crash back in the year 2000 is people wanted to accelerate the internet in terms of what it could do. They wanted to get that uh, thing happening much faster than, than it should have. And, and that's what crashed it. So uh, I, I hope that we, we keep our, our level, our heads uh, on, a, on a level, uh, level basis uh, so that we don't hype things too no. much. I wanted to, uh, you, you made this comparison with the internet now a, a bunch of times, and I actually wanted to ask, you know, there have been all these different uh, technological sort of revolutions and evolutions during the past decade. You know, there was the mobile, rise of mobile smartphones, cloud computing, the social web, of course, the internet itself. Um, so do you think Bitcoin is most similar to the rise of the internet? Well, Bitcoin uses the internet, right? So uh, it's, it's a very important overlay. It's an overlay uh, on the internet. Um, and the properties it has are multifaceted. Uh, the, the genesis, obviously, is money. So this is a new component that we did not have before. Uh, there is a technology component 
with uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain specifically. So Bitcoin is the currency component, so it's going to affect money, but the blockchain is a technology component. Uh, so there it's going to affect transformations. So the analogy is that uh, back in the 90s as well, there was a big uh, movement to do re-engineering, if you remember. Uh, in 92 or so, uh, Michael, uh, Champ uh, Michael uh, Hammer and, uh, and James Champy were uh, championing the causes of doing re-engineering in, in, in big companies. And the idea was you had to start by removing the old processes and uh, uh, rethinking everything that companies were doing because IT was this new enabler. So I hope that uh, the blockchain is seen as, a, as an enabler of uh, re-engineering and reimagining things uh, for, for big companies and for small companies. So, uh, so it takes a while to, to re rethink uh, uh, with, with new, new solutions in mind. Now, the way it starts usually is you, you start to do uh, you bring in a new technology and you start to do the same thing you were doing before with a new technology without a lot of innovation. This is usually step one. But then later, as you get more experience, you start to say, well, let's, let's rethink completely how, we, how we're doing something. And, and then let's start from, from scratch. Uh, and, and, and that's, I think, where the opportunities are going to be, is in, in seeing new, totally new uh, ways and and like new companies, new behaviors. Uh, and I, I talked about that in one of my uh, blog posts where uh, looking, I tried to be a little bit forward thinking in terms of where Bitcoin was taking us. And I put these uh, activities into four buckets. The first bucket is, is in having uh, new companies and new behaviors that we have not seen before. The second bucket is inside existing companies. So bringing the blockchain into uh, existing companies and, and figuring out how it's going to change things inside. The outcome will be that industries will be changed. Some industries will be transformed. That's the third component. And the fourth component is just seeing it as technology. So it is changing the technology stack that we are used to uh, using. So there are many pieces in the, in the blockchain, in the cryptocurrency a space that uh, are, are new pieces of the stack. If you're a developer, uh, you're gonna be familiarized now with things like uh, distributed hash tables. What is that? Or uh, IPFS, I'm not gonna go into the details, but uh, and uh, distributed applications where uh, the browser does different things than just have running JavaScript. We can go into that later on if you want, but there's a new architecture that is uh, a new paradigm, basically, uh, if you are a developer. Uh, so you have to use new tools. In the same way that the web, uh, even though it started as a content publishing platform, then with the advent of Java and, and other languages, then it became a development environment. Uh, so the blockchain is a great development environment. Uh, the only difference is that it's still a bit early, it's a bit immature, and not all the pieces are there. So if you're developing for the blockchain, you still have to put all the pieces together, more or less, on your own. And, and that's some of the challenges that we have today if you're a developer, although it is getting better. So um, you've talked about this analogy that Bitcoin, you've written, written a blog post, that Bitcoin is like the new cloud. And uh, you, you said that blockchain infrastructure doesn't replace cloud computing, but it sort of unbundles it, it democratizes it. Can you, explain, can you explain that? And can you also explain what some of the consequences of such an unbundling and democratization would be? Yes, for sure. Uh, well, when you look at the blockchain, the, the number one thing that comes to mind, people think of it as a uh, distributed ledger as a programmable ledger, which is fine. It is that. But what it is also is a big infrastructure. As we know, the uh, infrastructure, meaning the computers, the machinery, the, the, 
the actual hardware uh, for uh, mining uh, the uh, Bitcoin network, basically. There's a lot of computing power out there. There's more than 6,000 nodes right now around the world uh, that uh, surpass the, the performance of uh, supercomputers that exist today. So this infrastructure is like a cloud infrastructure. And it's, it's, yes, it is validating the transactions, but it is also really running transactions. It is validating transactions. So in a way, it, it, is, it is like a cloud. You are running applications. You are running software on, on this network of computers that is global. And the implications are that it, it's a new architecture, basically. Uh, so the developers now have this this new uh, infrastructure, uh, what's really interesting is that they don't have to set up servers. If you were to go to Amazon today, as easy as it is, you still have to set up a server. You have to uh, open up an instance and uh, configure it. And, and although it's easy, it'd be getting easier, but you still have to do that. Uh, with blockchain uh, networks, whether it's a Bitcoin uh, blockchain or another blockchain, uh, the ones that are global specifically, you just worry about the application that you are writing. And you, you write it in a way that uh, it, it's aware of the, of the blockchain, it's aware of the network, and you execute basically these little programs on, on the blockchain uh, in the form of smart contracts, which are really business logic. Um, so I'm saying this is a thin cloud because I don't want to give the illusion that this is going to replace the current cloud. I mean, you cannot write uh, enterprise-wide, uh, enterprise-level types of applications, but these are little programs. But it's a start. It's okay to start with little programs, with little smart uh, programs, that does, uh, smart contracts that just do a little bit of logic, uh, but at least they run it. They run it efficiently, and it comes back. And it's very cheap. It's uh, we're talking uh, in the cents uh, kind of levels now. Why? Why do you think it is cheap? Because I mean, Bitcoin is expensive, right? I mean, as far as I know, Ethereum is going to be very expensive, right? To run uh, things on Ethereum. Um, why do you say it will be cheap? Not necessarily. Maybe at the beginning it might be a little bit more expensive than it will be at the end. Because the cost is shared. It's like a crowdfunded, uh, it's like a crowdsourced uh, sharing of the infrastructure. Uh, overall, the number is big uh, to run the network, but when you divide that up by the number of users that are on it, uh, we're talking into the cents, into the sub dollar level uh, for running little things. And the, the vision is that it should be, it should be about the same as what you're paying for internet access. If you have a really good internet access, um, you probably have to pay $50 per month, more or less to $100, depending where you are in the world. But if you bring that down on a daily basis, you're paying $2 a day, more or less. So we're talking those kinds of levels. Uh, $2 a day, yeah, dollar, but $2 for what? Like For running, for running programs that, uh, that you, uh, you would be responsible for that are providing value uh, to you in the form of a business logic, in the form of, uh, of something that is of value to you, which the value is going to be more than what you're paying, of course. So th this is the way that I, I see this. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're, what you're talking about when you, when you talk about little programs is basically decoupling what we now see as cloud solutions. So if, I would I would see this like this. So, for example, Dropbox. So, there many components to what Dropbox offers. Dropbox offers you know, different levels of um, uh, of uh, cloud storage size, like capacity, and then there's permissions, and then there's sharing, and there's all these things. If you decouple that, then you would have like storage, sharing, permissions, perhaps um, the ability to view files in your browser, and these are all different components of that application, and you know, perhaps in the future, what we can what we can envision is that rather than having one service, which is Dropbox, which had all these features, we would have all these decoupled features, and then perhaps you have another feature, which is another smart contract that you could plug into 
uh, just the the uh, hosting component. And then if you want to add sharing, you can also add that in there. Is that sort of what what you're describing in terms of decoupling the cloud infrastructure that we have now? Yeah, that, that's that's one way of to describe it. Uh, the other way to describe it is that uh, it's it's like a form of SaaS. It's a software as a service uh, kind of uh, utility. Uh, so imagine now if you can, if you are a business user inside a company, and uh, you can uh, run these uh, smart contracts yourself without uh, going to IT. So that's the other big implication of running little programs on the blockchain. It is eventually when we start to put these programs in the hands of business users and make it as easy as uh, opening a browser and launching uh, something, and then I think that's the big impact that is going to happen down the line. And that's, that's a big implication for companies. So I think the, what I'm describing here is going to take a little bit from cloud computing uh, types of, of budgets, let's say, and a little bit from the SaaS, from running software as a service uh, component. So it, it's, it's, a new, it's a new form of, of running uh, programs, uh, of, of running uh, business logic between people, between companies, uh, but it's really a microtransaction. Uh, it's going to start, at least the way we see it right now, as a, at the microtransaction level, uh, so by bits and pieces. Uh, and, and then uh, what's, what I'm really excited, ex what's really exciting is when we start to put this in the hands of business users, because business users can take it in any way they want. They know their business, and they know their use cases, and, and that will empower them uh, to, to really propagate this, this, uh, this technology uh, uh, more globally. Our show today is brought to you by Voltura.com, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Now, when you live in Berlin or in France or in a lot of comfortable places like the US, etc., we often forget that when you put money in the bank, you don't actually control it anymore and it's not really yours. So when things go wrong, do you still have access to it? Maybe, maybe not. And I think the Greece thing has that really illustrated that. And it's illustrated that some forms of money are protected from that. And Bitcoin's one of them, and gold is one of them. That's right. And if you want to start buying some gold, you can do that very easily with Valtoro.com. You can start trading as little as one milligram of gold. And you don't even need to do any KYC if you're buying less than $5,000 worth of Bitcoins per day. So that just eliminates all barriers to entry. So, And the, the gold that you buy on Voltoro belongs to you. It doesn't belong to Voltoro. It doesn't belong to some third party. You own the gold legally. So go to Voltoro.com and start trading some gold today. And we would just like to thank Voltoro for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So moving on to business models, this is something that we've discussed quite a bit. And, and, and we still can't really wrap our heads around how these things will be monetized. Um, the very fact that Say for example, Open Bazaar is decentralized, uh, and we'll get to Open Bazaar in, in a second. Uh, but the very fact that it's decentralized, it's hard to to see how you can, you know, as a company building this, have a business model around it. Can you talk about what business models will look like in, in these decentralized app worlds, and how they'll differ from uh, existing uh, business models in, in the in the tech space? Okay. Um well, one of the parameters that's changing here in the, uh, in the era of decentralization is that the centers are becoming, again, using that word thinner. The centers are going to control less, uh, but they are going to empower more, and they are going to get flattened. Uh, so which means that, I mean, look at the Bitcoin network, which is the, uh, uh, the great example of, of distributed uh, uh, of a distributed infrastructure uh, there is no center to Bitcoin uh, the only thing closest to a center is the five or so core developers that are really at the center of it uh, but everybody else that is contributing to Bitcoin is at the periphery is at the edge of the network so innovation is really happening at the edge of the network at the edge of those uh, old centers. 
Um, so the business models, I mean, it's very difficult. I mean, at this point, it, it, is, it is difficult. I mean, I can talk in generic terms in terms of what the business models might be, but they are going to be very peculiar to every particular situation uh, that will apply uh, what their business is all about. And, and, and they'll develop these business models themselves based on their business specifically. So first of all, there's one, one thing that is for sure is that the blockchain is technology. So there will be uh, the equivalent of, of software services uh, that will prolif proliferate around the blockchain technology itself. Uh, so uh, a lot of, there are a few companies today that are taking the approach that, hey, it's just software. Um, so being just software, uh, we can help you to uh, develop solutions for it. Uh, we can help you to uh, integrate uh, the uh, uh, technology into what you're doing. And, um, and, and that's kind of the services model. So there, there's lots of that going on. But part of, the, part of the technology is knowing where to place that technology. It's the same as IT. I mean, IT on its own doesn't do too much unless you know exactly what kind of business it's going to enable. I think uh, one way of looking at it, I, I don't know if you will agree with that, but if you just sort of focus on Bitcoin for a moment, right? Maybe one or one way that people have often thought about Bitcoin is that like a Bitcoin is a little bit like owning a share of this big decentralized distributed enterprise project. So if that's the case, and if that's true, then I guess one of the implications of that could be if all these companies like Coinbase, ChangeTip, and so on, are building things that then enhance the value of, you know, of this project, of this sort of decentralized enterprise, well, of course, the, the, all the value they create, the question is, you know, does that go to the companies at the edge or does it go to the center and sort of that center enterprise? And if the second is the case, does that mean they'll be left out and the sort of all the benefit goes to the Bitcoin holders and the companies don't manage to build profitable businesses around it? I think one area where we've seen this a little bit happening maybe is payment processing because uh, obviously a service like BitPay is super valuable for Bitcoin uh, and it helps a lot with adoption and people can pay places and stuff. But do they have a business model? I mean, the problem is, right, if you have different companies competing there, you know, you'll have a, a they compete on price and it may be very hard for them to make money in the long term. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, here's how I would, I would look at it. There are three pieces to the to the, to the marketplace. Uh, one is the infrastructure level. The second piece is the middleware services. And the third piece is the applications. It's the same thing as the internet. So at the infrastructure level, you have the miners, they're making money, that's fine. And then the middleware payments, exchanges, I mean, they are kind of a middleware because they're in the middle. Yeah, they'll, they'll make money as well because they have to take a cut uh, on the transaction perhaps, but it's a small, much a smaller, it's a much smaller cut uh, where there's the most excitement is in the, at, the, at the application level. At the, so what are the applications? There, uh, the field is wide open uh, and that's where the innovation is going to happen. But it kind of comes in, goes into stages. We have to have a solid infrastructure and we have to have a rich uh, choice of middleware services, uh, of software, of building blocks, basically. And then it will make the life of the application uh, of the those that are building the applications much easier. So in, in back again to the business models, it, it's, uh, I, I think the value is going to be in uh, the, bigger, the bigger segment is going to be in the, at the application level when these uh, uh, middleware uh, enabling technologies become a little bit more mature, uh, then somebody can look at the uh, a music space or can look at the content space or can look at the e-commerce space and then you take every industry one at a time uh, the financial services as well of course it's a big one that's uh, has a lot of potential in, in using the blockchain so 
there is going to be innovation in, 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 a, in every particular segment, in every particular industry, uh, in, in applying uh, the, uh, the blockchain technology. The one common element is, is the issue of, this, uh, of the trust, of the validation. So what the, one of the innovations of, uh, of the blockchain is that it lets you uh, perform a, a validation or a trust uh, without a particular intermediary. Uh, so it simplifies uh, a settlement, it simplifies uh, ver verifying uh, that uh, a transaction uh, is going to the right person without having somebody in the middle uh, verifying that. So generically speaking, uh, a lot of intermediaries might be threatened uh, by the blockchain if their job today involves something like a clearinghouse type of uh, uh, service, or if it involves settlement. So one uh, a book that has gotten a lot of attention, I think, in the startup space was uh, a book by Peter Thiel, who, among other things, founded, was one of the founders of PayPal, uh, called Zero to One. And in it, he argued that sort of the only way to build a you know, really profitable business, technology business, you know, is to build a monopoly which then you know allows you to use your market power to charge high prices, make a lot of money. And of course, if you look at the big technology successes like Facebook, Google, Amazon, eBay, etc., uh, they all have been uh, monopolies in in the main area they make money, at least. Um, so, how is that going to work out in in the decentralized space? Because I think there's a first of all. Uh, people don't like monopolies at all in this area. And there's also the question whether they are compatible with the technology itself. Because if you decentralize, where's the monopoly? Does that mean no money will be made? Or it will be much more distributed and small and not, not, no huge enterprises will be built? Well, I think the monopoly uh, is going to be in the form of a protocol. Uh, but it's not really a monopoly because it's going to be open. So there will be some open protocols, and the whole basis is openness now. So, I mean, Bitcoin is an open protocol. Anybody can fork it, right? Ethereum is an open protocol. Uh, open Bazaar is an open protocol. Uh, open Assets is also an open API. So a lot of the technologies start are starting to be uh, as, as an open, uh, starting with that openness in mind. And um, then they, what they do is they start to achieve some network effects. And the analogy here is that uh, we want these protocols to be adopted. Uh, we want them to be uh, globally adopted so that there are lots of users that are on these protocols. And in the same way that uh, you then start to realize what the business model is once you have a lot of users, the same thing is going to happen. Uh, with the network effects. But I think the implications of what you're saying would be that there won't be these kind of massive companies like a, a Google or something, right? Because if the network effects are with the protocol and if nobody owns the protocol uh, or if it's owned by a whole huge distributed group, well, where's the company, right? It's still, I mean, it's still a little bit uh, not clear how this whole thing is going to unravel. Uh, we can just speculate, but in an informed manner, I think there will be a lot of opportunities to build uh, and to provide services on top of these protocols that are value-added services. And maybe there are new forms of intermediaries, for example, that uh, uh, that's get created on, on the protocol that offer services that are, are needed that can benefit others. And uh, maybe those services may not be as expensive as uh, what the central uh, uh, kind of parts were doing before that. So definitely there's going to be a, a more wider distribution of, uh, of opportunities uh, at, at the edges of the network, at the peripheries of the network. And uh, it, it is still not clear whether that will create a lot of small companies that are uh, multiplied basically or whether it will create 
uh, bigger giants, big giants like the Google and the Facebooks that we know. Uh, but definitely it is starting right now with the openness in mind and uh, with, with trying to, to, to reach as, as many people as possible globally. And, and then we'll see what happens. So you've been an advisor uh, as well to uh, Ethereum. Uh, tell us what excites you about that project. Okay, so <laughs> it's, it's been a long time in the making, obviously, as, as you know. Uh, what's really exciting about Ethereum is, is they, it's different than Bitcoin as a, as, a, as a blockchain. So that's kind of where people get hung up initially, and they try to compare it to, to Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin itself, just uh, to put that uh, aside, Bitcoin is a very tough act to follow. Uh, people look at it and they say, oh, it's a network, it's an open source, uh, I get users, I have a cryptocurrency, fine. I can do the same thing, and then uh, it becomes like Bitcoin. But it's not very easy to, be, to copy the Bitcoin model. Uh, it's, it's got a long lead uh, ahead of uh, any, any other blockchains out there. Uh, but the Ethereum approach has been different in that, first of all, uh, the, co the consensus model, they are uh, arriving at, is going to be a proof of stake in instead of proof of work. So the implication, it's a technical implication, is that the mining will not be as expensive and that anybody on the network could be a node to, to power uh, the running of the, uh, of the blockchain. They, they, would, they would like to do proof of stake, right? It will be proof of work and they will work, you know, maybe at a later stage they'll switch to that. It's, it's, moving, it's moving fairly uh, decisively towards the proof of stake as a deployment uh, option. Uh, so I'm talking long term. Uh, yeah. The other big uh, difference is that the currency itself, uh, they don't call it a currency. It is a cryptocurrency if you kind of technically call it that way. But it's like fuel. Uh, it is fuel that runs the smart contracts, which are those little business logic uh, applications that, that run on the blockchain. So Ethereum is 100% optimized from day one to have programs run on the blockchain. So that, that is a very important difference as well uh, from uh, Bitcoin and the Bitcoin blockchain where, yes, you can run smart uh, contracts on the Bitcoin blockchain, but it takes a little bit more to make that happen. Uh, so if Ethereum is, 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 is really enabling a, a new uh, architecture uh, a new development architecture, which we're calling Web3 architecture, uh, where uh, at the first level, uh, the browser is, is a special purpose browser uh, that uh, contains uh, the beginnings of what we call the dApps, the distributed applications. And then the, th the second element is the blockchain, and the third element is the virtual machine, which is really the network, of, uh, the whole network of computers uh, that are uh, validating the transactions. So when you put this together, you have a new three-tier architecture uh, that uh, allows developers to develop uh, the distributed applications, uh, which are taking a lot of uh, different uh, segments and, and, and then uh, innovating specifically. Uh, uh, so we will see different types of applications like uh, crowdfunding or uh, uh, stamping of origin uh, for products uh, or prediction markets and uh, financial derivatives and so on. So pretty much uh, any, any application that you think uh, you can think of probably will have a, a smart contract uh, DAP equivalent uh, that could be built uh, on the Ethereum platform. So Ethereum is really a development uh, environment. It's a development uh, platform uh, that brings a new paradigm uh, to, uh, to how uh, applications are written. And, and it runs on its own blockchain, uh, the Ethereum blockchain, uh, but it will also be in, interoperable with other uh, blockchains uh, in, in terms of passing uh, values back and forth. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be uh, on its own as an island. And, and that's how I see things in the future as well. Blockchains will talk to each other. I was going to ask you about that. So this one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is I mean, what was so great about the web is that you had one protocol, HTTP, and 
where you have browsers that are all compatible and you can build all these applications with HTTP, I mean, over HTTP, but what seems to be happening with all these blockchain technologies is we'll have multiple protocols. You have Bitcoin, you have you know, Ethereum, you may have OpenBazaar, like some other blockchains uh, may also come up. Um, so I, I'm not sure how that's going to play out in the future. Like it seems like perhaps we'll be coming more to an app-based model where each app will be speaking specifically to one protocol or maybe, who knows, maybe like you mentioned, uh, if uh, all these protocols can talk to each other, um, we can have like one type of browser or one type specific type of software, whether it be a mobile app or a desktop app that can talk to all of these blockchains at the same time. Yeah, I definitely. I mean, that's where it's, it's going to have to go that way. Uh, if you think about the sidechains uh, project, uh, it, it is a form of interoperability with the Bitcoin blockchain. So they, they kind of freeze the, uh, uh, the value, uh, the, the Bitcoins, and then they, they do some work on the sidechain and then they, they, they bring it back. Uh, so that is a form of, of interoperability. And we can see more of that uh, that's going to happen. It could be at the cryptocurrency level. So it could be just an exchange. So I perform something in Ethereum uh, with Ether, and then I, there's a value that I go and exchange it into Bitcoins. Or it could be at the file level. Uh, there is a, maybe some data that is the, then uh, uh, kind of transacted upon in, into one blockchain, but then it gets passed to another uh, blockchain uh, uh, or it could be a file. Um, so there will be different levels of uh, interoperabilities uh, between uh, the different uh, platforms uh, that the blockchains uh, are powering. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins, and they now support over 30 of the most popular altcoins, including Dash, Swarm, Peercoin, Vertcoin, Dogecoin, gems, and so many others. The list just goes on. When you want to trade some altcoins, forget about using exchange. What, do you still use a Walkman? No, that's so 20, like, that's not even 20. That's like 1995, man. Just go to shapeshift.io and get it done in less than one minute with no account or sign up required. Here's how it works. You head over to shapeshift.io. You choose the currency you want to sell. Let's say you want to get rid of some Bitcoins and the currency you want to buy. Let's say you want to buy Dogecoin. You then simply send the Bitcoins to the Shapeshift address, they exchange it for you and put the Dogecoins directly into your wallet. Super easy, boom, done, no account, nothing required. By the way, uh, Shapeshift has just been running an equity crowd sale campaign, so you were actually able to buy equity in Shapeshift, unless you're American. And uh, you can check that out if you're interested at banktothefuture.com, that's B-N-K, dothefuture.com, we'll put a link in the show notes. So thanks so much for their support, and you can give it a try and trade some altcoins, trade some coins on shapeshift.io. So one of the main reasons why we wanted to get you on is because you are one of the investors, uh, along with Andreessen Horowitz and Union Square Ventures, I think two of the best known venture capital firms in the world, in the company OB1, which was started by uh, the guys, the main guys behind Open Bazaar, so Brian Hoffman, whom we've had on the show as well. Um, and I think this is really interesting because as far as I know, this is the first VC investment in, in uh, a protocol sort of that it can be monetized directly. You know, it's not owned it doesn't have like a token like Ether that hopefully will appreciate if the platform gets used. So it's it's really unclear where the business model is. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you decided to invest in OB1 and where do you see the potential here? Sure, I mean, it's not an obvious uh, answer, obviously. I had been uh, aware of Ob uh, of Open Bazaar, uh, almost from the day one, where when they started, as you know, the history of uh, Open Bazaar is that uh, it started as a as a hackathon uh, uh, winner at the Toronto uh, Bitcoin uh, conference uh, more than a year ago uh, here in in Toronto, just where I am right now, and I was actually in that room when they presented back in April of 2014, that was uh, Amir Taki at the time with Airbits. 
but there, Genesis was a, a dark market kind of application. A few weeks later, Brian Hoffman uh, saw that and uh, uh, decided to fork it, but uh, give it a very different departure uh, from the dark market roots that it had. And the vision of Open Bazaar is, is to really empower peer-to-peer -peer commerce without any intermediaries in the middle. So the idea is that anyone should be able to conduct commerce to buy and sell products, services, uh, digital goods as well, uh, without having any intermediaries in the middle, uh, either slowing things down or taking transaction fees or uh, not adding any value. So that is really the, 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 the vision of uh, Open Bazaar. So we were attracted by their vision. Uh, we were attracted by the team, uh, the quality of the team that uh, had that vision. And it turned out that they came together because uh, several of them had been having the same ideas in their minds. Uh, and they came together as a meeting of the minds. Uh, and they were both, they're, they're not both, they were like four of them initially, three or four. Uh, they all had the same uh, similar visions and, and Brian Hoffman, the leader of the project, put all of that together uh, and they turned it into an open source project and they started to add value uh, uh, to it. And where it is today is, is very different from its roots. Uh, one, of the, one of the key contributions that they added uh, that, uh, that they came up with is uh, adding what is called the Ricardian contracts. Uh, and recurring contracts are really uh, agreements, is really a way to say legal agreements uh, and how we're going to uh, put them in, in code and how we're going to enforce them. So what they did is they, they attached the multi-sig aspects of Bitcoin and they kind of taped it to, the, uh, 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 to a legal ag agreement uh, process, so the recurring contracts, and that then allows any two parties to uh, conduct commerce according to uh, rules that they both understand. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we will link to our episode on Open Bazaar in the show notes, I think, where we talked in depth about that. But what we didn't talk about there and, there and what we would love to talk about with you especially is uh, the idea of, you know, where's the business model? So I, I'm quoting here, uh, I read a, a blog post before from Brad Burnham, who is a VC at Union Square Ventures, one of the, the other investors. And so he wrote, because the marketplace is defined by a protocol and distributed across every participant server, the hosting costs are shared, and there's no way for a central authority to leverage network effect, market power to extract rent from participants. No, that's sort of the fundamental challenge about Open Bazaar. So, what do you see as the, the potential ways for that company, OB1, to become a, a profitable large company so that you will see a return as an investor? I don't have a clear answer, to be honest. We, uh, we, we went with, in the, with the investment with our eyes open, obviously, and we would love for them to be able to deploy that protocol, if nothing else. But the way that they've structured their company is with uh, the formation of OB1. And OB1 is the for-profit company that will provide services uh, that will run on the Open Bazaar protocol. So Open Bazaar is the open source protocol. Currently, it is being managed by the same team that also is part of OB1. So our investment is really in OB1. From a legal perspective, uh, I'm on the board of directors of OB1, not of Open Bazaar. Open Bazaar, in its uh, mature stage, is going to be an open source uh, protocol that uh, eventually will be turned to the community. I mean, the community uh, has a lot of say in determining the future uh, of Open Bazaar as a protocol. Uh, what the team at uh, uh, OB1 is doing is kind of leading it and managing it and making sure that it's going to happen according to the milestones, according to the timeline, according to the uh, results that are, are required uh, to kind of move that protocol forward. Uh, if I may paraphrase, I don't know if this is the way, uh, but this is sort of, I guess, 
how I think you guys are thinking about this and correct me if I'm wrong, but right, of course, uh, the Open Bazaar guys will be in, uh, in a great position in some way, right? If Open Bazaar becomes very successful, because first of all, they have a, a great weight in the community, they're known, have a, a weight in the development of the protocol, and they will presumably also have the deepest knowledge of the technology, so perhaps see the first to see the business opportunities where one can build money. So of course, in, in that way, maybe it makes sense to invest in them if they didn't la later leverage that position, uh, that influence and that knowledge to build profitable things, right? Even if it's not clear today what those will be. I mean, what, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, one one area that they've they've said that they are interested in uh, in entering is uh, being uh, like in the area of escrow services. So uh, when you do commerce between two two parties. Uh, with nobody in the middle, I mean, it's kind of, it's not exactly 100% correct. I mean, there will be uh, a new form of intermediary in the form of, a, of an escrow uh, agent in the middle in terms of uh, if there is a dispute resolution uh, or, or it could be a requirement. Uh, so there could be a possibility where they would offer uh, escrow services uh, as a new form of intermediary. Uh, but the fees that will be taken there are 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 kind of minimal and are, are not going to be similar to the uh, to the take rates that the that the central uh, uh, e-commerce uh, marketplaces are taking today uh, in the forms of the eBay and the Etsy's and the and the uh, Amazons and the ones we know about. Uh, so that's one way of of uh, thinking about it. I mean, there will be services on top of the protocol that will be. Uh, developed that will be innovated upon, and uh, that could be one one logical uh, way for them to uh, to be to be taking part of uh, where where some revenue might might come from. I'm curious, were there any parallels like this at the beginning of the internet where you had one company sort of standing behind a protocol and developing it, and with time sort of losing their monopoly as everybody adopted the protocol? Did, did that sort of thing happen 20 years ago? Uh, it's a good question. I have to think a little bit more. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe at one point, uh, Netscape, uh, if you recall, uh, Netscape is a company that uh, uh, became uh, what, uh, when Mark Andreessen uh, developed uh, the web browser as we know it today, in the form that we know it today, and then it became Netscape. And uh, I mean, they were, they were the best, uh, they were the, the browser that had the most uh, market share at one point in time, and then they started to develop uh, software services on, on in addition to the browser itself. So they had server, uh, they had they had commerce servers, they had content servers, uh, they had transaction servers, they had payment servers. So at one point, it looked like that maybe maybe they were the only game in town, but the reality is that that became fragmented afterwards. Um, I, I'm not able to th to think of. I mean. Maybe one way to think about it is TCP/IP. I mean, like at the proto at the technical protocol level, yeah, we have protocols that are standards. Um, if you think of um, maybe not directly internet related, but local area area networks, uh, at some point uh, there were like three com and there was Novell. Uh, again, this goes back more than twenty years ago, uh, and it, it looked like it was a battle, but then then it became a non-issue and. Uh, I mean, eventually, a protocol uh, should be neutral. A protocol should be uh, available for everybody. And that, that's the only way that uh, it's going to propagate. And the value becomes on top of the protocol, is what you add uh, in addition uh, to what the protocol offers. Um, so, uh, I mean, HTTP is, is a protocol. Uh, and... and uh, so it's it's I, I don't I cannot see a, a par direct parallel where um, a protocol was uh, commercialized uh, uh, that way with venture capital perhaps maybe it was commercialized by government uh, uh, grants or by uh, uh, donations uh, to the to have it developed uh, so that's the only thing I can think about but it should certainly it makes things interesting it makes things more interesting. So, so speak, speak, speaking of uh, a of, of VC, um, 
what what is the current state of uh, of VC funding right now in, in the cryptocurrency space, in your opinion? Uh, it's it's still timid, I would say. It is still timid. It is, it is not uh, totally on fire, I would say. Uh, I, I see a lot of uh, proposals and is it and, is it not on fire or is it not anymore on fire? No, it's not on fire in terms of. Uh, it, it's. I'll tell you where there's one. There's one area uh, where uh, it's a bit problematic. Is that some of the valuations at the seed level are a little bit high, a little bit too high for me at least, uh, and are a little bit high as well for the market in general. So you think valuations in the Bitcoin space are high compared to startups in general, early stage startups. I'm seeing the whole gamut. I'm seeing some reasonable ones, and I'm seeing ones that are coming with valuations in the uh, close to $10 million for a, a seed stage uh, investment with two people, uh, with uh, technology that they don't have yet, uh, with a lot of questions, uh, with uh, a lot of uncertainties, which is fine, but uh, really, with 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 a very immature product, uh, with a lot to build upon, and they they think they want to have ten million dollars as an early early. Uh, but isn't isn't that just a bunch of people who don't have a clue of the market and have a slightly exaggerated opinion of their own self worth? Or, or, I mean, I presume those people aren't getting funded by anyone. I, I'm seeing the whole range. I'm seeing some really smart people that. I don't know, have been told that they can get $10 million for a, for a valuation from day one, and, and they only have to uh, raise half a million, let's say, only give up 5% of the company. But that kind of investment is go only going to appeal to maybe a few angel investors that are willing to take, uh, uh, to take uh, a bet uh, and, and putting uh, twenty-five dollars or $50,000 uh, but then it makes it more difficult for this particular entrepreneur because they have to go and raise money from 10 or 15 people. Uh, I would rather have them, I would rather have companies be more reasonable, uh, have valuations in the range of three, four, five million, even six million dollars. And, and, and that opens up uh, the opportunities to, uh, uh, to micro VCs or VCs or uh, angels that are a little bit more level-headed that know uh, that, that there is a certain return that is expected that if you only give me 5% of your company, uh, I'm not going to be as interested as if you give me 10 or 15 yeah. or 20%. Uh, so, so obviously one of the things that gets a lot of attention in the press uh, and I think also, of course, in the Bitcoin community is the price and the cryptocurrency community is the, is the Bitcoin price. And as we all know, the Bitcoin price has not been doing super well, especially if we compare it to uh, November, December 2013. So how has that affected the ability of cryptocurrency startups to raise financing? I think it's, it's becoming a neutral effect right now. Uh, uh, like what, what, I, what I really find st interesting still is, is uh, the price is reacting more to uh, still to, to speculative uh, parameters. And I'm asking about the ability to get funding, not the price. Yes. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's a neutral, it's a neutral uh, point right now. Uh, it, it did not enter uh, at least... Uh, in my record, it did not enter the, the, the equation in, in, in the last uh, two deals that I was involved in uh, with the, uh, that are Bitcoin and blockchain related. Uh, it, it, it's, really, it's really a non-issue right now. I mean, if, if the volatility would be much higher, uh, it might be an issue. But at the end of the day, what you're investing in, at least what I invest in, is, is the potential of the business model, the potential of the technology. So I look at, uh, at the blockchain as a technology, as an enabling technology, and I look at what it's going to enable on the, in the business sense. So are you seeing, what, what, what types of companies are, are you seeing uh, VCs interested in investing in, and what companies are you particularly, well, what types of companies are you particularly invested in? Uh, 
I, I think it's going to start to get uh, down to the industry level. Uh, so you're going to take every, every industry is going to have perhaps five or ten uh, companies that will take a shot at changing that industry or will take a shot at providing solutions for that industry. So we're going to see some vertical uh, industry specific solutions and we're also going to see horizontal uh, plays uh, like content. The content space is uh, is is one aspect right now where uh, take digital assets or uh, or content ownership. Uh, it's a very natural application of the blockchain to be able to peg, to attach an ownership of a digital asset or a physical asset on the blockchain, uh, so that you can transact with it. And, yeah, I mean, I, I agree about the about the industry. Uh, what you mentioned about you know, sort of. Uh, disrupting industries, I, I feel like right now there's sort of a shift uh, from like in the last year we've seen a lot of startups uh, getting in the sort of consumer space, you know, pushing for adoption of Bitcoin wallets, this type of stuff. And now there seems to be some sort of a shift towards more of these ledgers, uh, blockchain technologies for finance, etc. Is this something that you've noticed as well? Yeah, I was going to talk about the financial as uh, financial services. Uh, I'm going to issue a warning here. The warning is is really, it's going to be up to the financial services companies and the banks themselves to figure out how to use the blockchain. Uh, most of the companies that are developing solutions for them, honestly, don't have a clue about how a bank runs or how financial services would really run. I mean, they are trying to. They are trying to understand it. But the reality is that the innovations is going to come when people from that industry start to really, really, really understand the potential of the blockchain in terms of what it enables. Because only they understand their business and only then they can figure out how to uh, apply this technology to, to uh, enable something new. Now, there will be some exceptions uh, of, of new players that will come up with something innovative. But trying to displace uh, the existing incum the, the incumbents in the financial services space uh, is going to be very difficult. You cannot take them head on. Uh, the innovation, unfortunately, has to come from within. Uh, so what I'm going to be spending a lot of my time is educating, uh, is educating the, the financial services executives on the potential of, of this technology. The same thing was happening with the internet. Uh, for the first few years, a lot of the CIOs did not even understand totally the impact of the internet. Uh, and and they, it took them a while to, to figure it out. The same thing is happening today. It's one thing to have a little project in one part of the bank with five people to understand, to try to understand the blockchain. And then if you go down the levels, it, it, and then you, you ask the CEO what, the, what they understand of what the blockchain does. There's a big gap in, in between having somebody having a project using the blockchain and, and having the CEO and the executives at the very top believing that this is a, a, a very innovative and very uh, enabling technology that's going to change things. Yes, I mean, similarly to how e-commerce... Uh, at first was just like one little pet project and then after a while companies started uh, having e-commerce as sort of a global uh, omni-channel strategy you know, within the, the, the strategy of the business, I, I think is what uh, is a, a similar analogy, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there, there, there's one, uh, uh, one exception maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, providing her any uh, promotion necessarily, endorsement. Uh, you have uh, Blythe Masters who, who, who came from the industry and now has uh, joined uh, uh, a Digital Assets Holding. So that is a person that understands the uh, financial industry. And if, if she can really, really understand the blockchain uh, uh, capabilities, then there could be some interesting solutions uh, coming out of it. So... I think it's, it's kind of it's something that I wrote in the when I wrote the paper, uh, the, the Ethereum paper, uh, explaining the business uh, value and the business imperative. And I said there is is 
The onus is really on the business people to understand what the blockchain technology can do. The blockchain innovators and the blockchain developers on their own cannot make that change happen. So the business people have to kind of meet them halfway through. Uh, as, as much as, as experts they can be in the development side, they do not understand the business uh, problems, challenges, opportunities that somebody has on the business side. Today's magic word is commerce, C-O-M-M-E-R-C-E. -E. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. You mentioned Bive Masters and, uh, you know, they, they just uh, purchased uh, Hyperledger whom we've also had on on the podcast. And then we just did an episode with Tim Swanson about this idea of permission blockchain, which Hyperledger is also a, a company in that space. Uh, and that always creates a lot, of, uh, a lot of controversy and people criticize us and wish that we get cancer in the comments and things like that for, for bringing uh, these topics up. So uh, I'm, I'm curious about you, what do you think when, especially when we talk about uh, financial services, big banks uh, adopting this kind of technology, will they use Bitcoin and the Bitcoin blockchain or will they do their own things with, you know, operating their own consensus systems? It's going, I think it's going to be all over the gamut. Uh, here's what, one, one difference that I see between what happened 20 years ago and now. 20 years ago, the banks were a bit conservative. They were fairly conservative. They waited, they waited, they waited. And then uh, when they had to do it, they did it because it took them a while to understand it. And if you look back in retrospect, the banks did not make any mistakes back then. And, and still to today, uh, they did not innovate too much. I mean, what's the biggest innovation we have uh, that combines banking and the internet today? It's having our bank ac uh, account on the smartphone or having online banking. It's not a huge innovation. It's really going from paper to seeing transactions online. So I would be critical of the banks uh, so far with the internet. However, what I'm seeing today is that the banks have an intent to try a few things. So what I could predict is that they will make some mistakes. I have a feeling it is not totally um, factual, but it's uh, it's kind of putting some pieces, some bits and pieces together from what I'm seeing. Uh, this time, they are not going to be afraid to making some mistakes and trying a few things. Uh, and that's why you're seeing, you're going to see a lot of pilots, a lot of um, uh, projects at a, with a smaller scope, uh, which might fail, by the way, which is fine. Uh, but hopefully they'll learn from these failures. And, and there, some of them will be inside the banks, like back end, this is perhaps, and some of them will be between the banks. I think there's a big kind of open space between the banks in terms of uh, clearing funds, settlements, uh, everything in the middle that has a clearing house kind of label on it is really up to grabs because uh, clearing houses are an intermediary and the blockchain threatens intermediaries in the same way that the internet has threatened intermediaries and it has created new intermediaries as, 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 a, as a return, uh, Amazon being one new intermediary and, and, uh, and others. So uh, it, it's, it's going to be a long road. I mean, we're, we're not uh, going to see all of that unravel next year. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, I think we're, we're sort of uh, up with our time and at the end of our episode. But uh, William, thanks so much for joining us. Also, uh, what we will do, of course, is, is link to your blog in the show notes and, and link to your blog posts because you've written, you've written quite extensively on this topic and, and uh, you write regularly on this topic. So I think for every, anybody who's, who's interested, you know, they, they can read your posts and, and also get in touch, I think, with you. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I think uh, talking about these like really important issues. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. And, uh, of course, thanks to our listener for joining us. So we, we, we put out new episodes of Epson and Bitcoin every Monday. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, on SoundCloud, or in, on your favorite podcast app. And you can also watch a video, uh, which we put out on YouTube, and that's at Epicenter BTC. 
And if you're a loyal listener and like the show, then do us a favor and leave us an iTunes review. We haven't asked for that for a while and you haven't left one for a while, but so we'll ask again now and please do so. We'd, we'd really appreciate that. And of course, send us a tip if you want to. So thanks so much and until next time. Thank you.